Okay, so welcome. June 8th, I think on my YouTube channel, I begin every video with okay, so I have to work on that. <laughs> Just because I pressed the re record button before I launch everything. So this is Tuesday, June 8th, class session, Math 264 at Delta College. And the exciting thing we're going to do today is talk about the technical details of linear systems. So you can totally understand the theory of two dimensional linear systems today. And then you can apply it. And this will get you into sections 3, 2, and 3, 3, get you through those two sections. Maybe fill in a detail on the homework problem you're submitting tonight and start working on the next homework problems. It'll also will be slightly reaching into three, four. That's, that's the hand reaching. Okay. In other news, uh, your exams were submitted last night. Thank you very much. Uh, they are graded. Solutions are posted right now on our website. I'll show you where that is. And I will return everyone's papers to their return paper folder by 3 p.m. today. So kind of my workflow is here. We get out of this class. I upload the notes. I upload any office hour notes. I upload the video. And, and then uh, I'll upload these graded exams with current grade reports to your folder. So I just try to create a workflow where everything is current one hour after class is over. Uh, I'll take a peek over to my website to show you exactly where the solutions are posted. And it is the same procedure I use with my homework. I have no problem if you wanna ask about how I graded something or why I graded something. Absolutely no problem. Just send me an email, tell me what you're looking at, tell me what you'd like to know. But I do ask that you read the solutions before you do that. And that is, you know, maybe seeing an answer would answer your question. Just so that, you know, when you ask me a question and when I respond, this is what I did, this is why I did it. That you have seen the answer and you do know what, you know, we both are talking about the same thing. Okay, so just to give you the tip on that, let's go over to browser window right here. So in our week three window, so exam one is now over, and maybe I'll adjust that reference, but under week two or week three or our resources, week three assessments, exam one, where you've got the exam solutions, you click on this and it will pull, pull up the uh, solutions from a Google Drive folder. And I'll let that come up just so you see what that looks like. Uh, so here's solutions, instruction page, solution one. Sometimes I write them, sometimes I type them. Uh, now, again, these are not the only way to do things. So don't look at my problem and say, if yours does not look like mine, then yours is wrong or mine is wrong. No, I'm just showing you one way they could have been done. And, you know, according to the things that we talked about. So I did see different people do things different ways. And that's okay as long as you know, we have to arrive at the same place, we have to arrive at the same answer, we have to agree on the same mathematical truth. So uh, the examples I post here are only meant to be examples of solutions, not the one and only best solution. Okay, go backwards here. Got that going. Got that going. Okay, good. So I'm going to get out of this window and we're going to jump pretty quickly 
into our presentation today. No, you have a homework problem. Notice you have a homework problem due tonight, which is 3125 alt. And yesterday we talked about verifying solutions to linear systems. We did some example in detail about that. And that's part A of that problem, although that problem is a little fancier than the one we did in class. And part B of that problem talks about this particular word linearly independent solutions. And we'll talk about that in more detail today. So I think you're covered for that one problem there. And then you can even probably move on to 3, 2, and 3, 3. You should have all the equipment you need to do 3, 2, and 3, 3 after today's discussion. There's a positive thing about chapter three, and that is it's kind of mechanical. It's kind of procedural, and it's a good place to make up some ground or pick up some points. Oh, I should say that points and grade reports. Now remember your grade reports were aiming for about 32 to 34 homework problems. We'll take the best 24. So right now on your grade reports, you know, I've got five, four, three, two, one, zero. And you have the number of fives you receive, the number of fours you receive, the number of threes, et cetera. We haven't done 24 problems. So the list below it is the best 24. But let's say you had uh, 15, six, three, seven, one. Let's see, how many is that? 21, 31, 32. Let's say by the end of the class, you had 15 fives, six fours, three threes, seven twos. It's just totally fictitious. Then what is the best 24 of these? Well, you get to keep the 15 fives, you get to keep the six fours, that's 21. You get to keep the three, let's make this a two. Let's make this an eight, just so you can illustrate. You get to keep the two threes. Now that's 23 problems. And to make the 24 best, you're going to get to keep one of these twos, or you have to keep one of these twos. So this is what your grade report might look like as we get closer to the end. I'm sorry, let me make sure I am on my paper. So you're collecting fives, fours, threes, twos, ones, and zeros. And maybe by the end of the semester, you've got 15, five, six, fours, two, threes, eight, twos. This is a fictitious grade report. When I say best 24, I mean, I'll count down till you fill up 24 problems. That's 15, six, two, and one of the twos. So then you multiply by five multiply six by four, multiply two by three, you multiply one by two, and that would be how many points you have from the homework, which in this case is what? 99 and eight would be, what's 99 plus eight? 107. The total homework problem, problems possible would be 120. So it's a sample homework scores. So out of the 120 points max, this fictitious person got 107. Now, of course, your goal is to maximize this number to get as close to 120 as you can, which means you want to kind of fill up the box with fives. If you can, and fours, it, okay, you lose one point there, right? Threes, you drop two points, but you don't want to collect a lot of twos or ones or zeros. Okay, so that's the philosophy of that keeping the best 24 out of 34 there. Okay, good. So if you have other questions about that, you read that on the grade report, you want to see how that works. Just send me a note and ask me a question. So I got to jump right into what we're going to do. And the discussion we're having today is in three 
two and three, three essentially, and we'll reach a little bit into three, four, but we want to know the technical details of where I got those sample solutions last time and why they actually work. So that's where we're gonna jump into. Okay, and then if you have questions, throw them in the chat and I'll keep monitoring that as we go along. And we'll show you some graphics along with us today. Okay, so let me switch to a different color right here. So remember, and I won't always title things or name things with all the adjectives now, but remember we have our most famous differential equation, first order differential equation, y of zero equals y naught. This is the MVP of ODEs. And one reason why it's a very valuable problem is because it has a very simple solution. Solution is why not e to the kt. But we wanted to say this to you last time. These are just symbols, these are operations. By the way, I think today I'm going to start preferring y prime to dy dt because dy dt is four letters in a bar y prime is one letter in a prime you know much faster to write but apart from the mathematical idea that this is the answer to the problem the real reason i'm excited about it is because it's a simple expression of differentiation this says in English, the derivative of y is a multiple of y. And when you're handed that situation, you're handed a gift, a big, big gift. If the derivative of y is a multiple of y, then y is very easy to describe. This is the description right here. Now we've encountered this case when we tried to expand this to a system. And for a while, I will write systems in like three presentations until you get used to them being exactly all the same. And so the first presentation is the first order. linear system. The first presentation is the most verbose presentation, the most full symbolically, ax plus by and cx plus dy. A, B, C, and D are any real numbers, any constants you please. And notice again, I'll say x prime and y prime instead of dx dt and dy dt, just for compactness and efficiency of notation. That's one way we've expressed this. We've also expressed this in the matrix language. And that is vectors and matrices that x prime and y prime together form a vector being differentiated. I could literally put the prime on the vector. And The two expressions, the two functions on the right hand side are literally this matrix ABCD times the vector XY. So this is a more compact notation and it draws your attention to the matrix ABCD, the matrix and their entries and its entries. When we're done, seeing these four numbers will be enough to characterize the problem. And that's why I express those four numbers in this fashion. Here I'm expressing the four numbers too, but uh, the X and the Y are just distractors. But when I really want to go compact, I think of the X, Y vector as just a vector, let's call it Y. Y is a traditional dependent variable for differential equations. So the X, Y vector is called Y and X, Y primed derivative We'll just call it y prime. 
And for short, because sometimes it's even annoying to write down A, B, C, D, we just use a capital A traditionally to represent that matrix. And then over here is X and Y. So the reason we're excited about this notation right here, so this is a this or this or this. These are all three of the same presentations. But the reason I'm excited about this presentation is because I just said it again, derivative is a multiple of y. A fancier multiple, but derivative is a multiple of y. So this is very nice. If derivative is a multiple of y over here, gave me a very simple solution with the exponential, then maybe derivative is a multiple of y gives me a similar simple solution with an exponential. Now, I haven't given you the initial conditions over here, right? So let's say that I also assign initial conditions to this. X of zero equals X naught. Y of zero equals Y naught. Or I could just say, to show you the different notations, vector y at zero is x naught y naught. But I can even shorten that to be vector y naught. So again, looking very much like this expression. Then I'm really, really excited because then I say to myself, maybe there's a proposed solution here. Solution? Let's just try to imitate that exactly. Maybe I could say y, the solution of t, is y naught vector times e to the not kt, but a t. And in fact, this is true. <laughs> I'm trying to compare make a very large picture into a relatively small space. This is actually a true statement, but it's not the way we're gonna to prefer to talk about it because it's a little bit unwieldy, although not impossible and still mathematically technically accurate to talk about an exponential raised to a matrix power. What would that mean e to the at? Right? I think of the matrix A, remember the matrix A is A, B, C, D. I can think of multiplying by T, no problem. Just multiply each slot by T. But what would it mean to take the matrix A, raise E to a matrix power? And you've generally raised the exponential, Euler's number E, to real number powers or complex number powers in some cases. So this is true, but a little bit unwieldy, a little bit diff difficult to wield, a little bit difficult to swing, as if you're talking about a sword or a sledgehammer. So I want to exploit another coincidence between these two. So there's my next speech, another color. Let's see how pink comes out. Can we exploit? Pink is not too bad. Can we exploit the coincidences here in a simpler? more procedural fashion. That's true, you'll read many books and they give you the presentation like this and then they explain it and then you do it and you're happy. But I want to give you a different presentation. So this is gonna to lead to the solutions we built last time. First, we have to establish a fact.
And by the way, I should say this today too. I'll slide my paper up, get someone else in the room. Here we go. So first we have to establish a particular fact. Let me slide the paper up. And I'm gonna use this moment to say to you that in the background, I want you to never go beyond two by two matrices. We're only gonna apply the truths that I'm telling you to two by two matrices. But the truths that I am telling you can be applied to any matrix. So you're allowed to, any square matrix, you're allowed to do this to three by three matrices. You're allowed to do this to four by four, six by sixes, 100 by 100 matrices. And in fact, that's people deal with those and much larger in applied contexts. So here's this fact. From the real numbers, we know this. If you multiply two real numbers, a times b and get zero, then a is zero or b is zero. You know, it sounds very, very trivial. It sounds like the very first thing you learn. And you use that to solve equations and things like that. If you factor something, one of the fact, and the, the product of the factors is equal to zero, and one of the factors is equal to zero. So you take this as a given you're never going to multiply two and three and get zero. And in fact, if I cover up these two numbers and tell you their product is zero, you're guaranteed that there's either a zero under my green pen or there's a zero under my black pen. So you take that as granted. But in matrix land, it's not exactly that way. We have to say this differently. This is such an important fact that I'm taking that moment to write it down. So let's say that you had a matrix, a matrix. Any square matrix, although in our discussion, we're only gonna talk about two by twos. And then let's say you had a vector. Let's just say V for vector, very generic. And I put a little vector hat on that. Let's try to put vector hats on our vectors so people know we're talking about vectors. So I'm talking about the situation right here, matrix times vector. So matrix times vector, Let's think about this. Two by two times two by one will produce a two by one, will produce another vector. So when I say zero here, I can't say zero the number. I have to say zero the vector. So the vector that has a zero and a zero in it, the two slots are both zero. This is a statement about numbers. This is a statement about vectors. It would be beautiful if that forced one of these two people to be zero. But that is not true. For example, sorry, I'm not, I'm being a little bit sloppy with my paper. For example, let's take this matrix, three, four, zero, zero, and let's multiply by this vector, zero, seven, do you see that when you multiply this matrix times this vector, you get what? Zero and zero. And above, you used to say, oh, goody, you know, oh, great. Goody is too old. One of these people's got to be zero because I multiplied two things and it got zero. One of them's got to be zero. And then you look at this and you like gasp. Oh, shoot. It's not that way with matrices. So how do I finish the sentence with matrices? And do I lose out on something big? Because it's not the way I expected it to be. 
The answer is we don't lose out on anything. Here's how we finish the sentence. If you multiply a matrix times a vector and get the zero vector, then either the vector is filled with zeros, the zero vector, or the determinant of the matrix is zero. Not the matrix is zero, but the determinant, and remember what determinant is, D, determinant of A, the determinant of the matrix A, B, C, D, this is very critical today, is A, D minus B, C. If you multiply a matrix times a vector and get zero, then either the determinant of A is zero or the vector is zero. And so did this example that I just wrote down screw us up? No, the vector is not zero, but look at the matrix. Its determinant is zero. Now it's not a moral judgment or a value judgment, but what are we gonna say about that matrix? It's bad in some way, right? It's deficient. No, those are, those are kind of like emotional descriptions. When a matrix has determinant zero, then this matrix is called singular. I don't quiz you on vocabulary words. I don't make you use them, but if someone else uses them around you, you have to know what they mean. So let's not call this matrix bad or evil or wrong or broken. It's singular, singular in the sense of the English language, which means unique. Why unique or out of the ordinary? Why out of the ordinary? And if you think about it for a second, it is out of the ordinary to have a matrix whose determinant is zero. Why? Because if you just pick four numbers at random, like one minus five, uh, 13 and one half. Here I picked four strange numbers at random. What's the determinant of this matrix? That's well, one half plus 65, that's 65 and one half. I don't like to write mixed fractions, but that's just what this number is right now. 65 and one half, that's better than saying 131 over two. Do you understand my point? I, I pick four numbers at random, usually I do not get zero determinant. So when I do get a zero determinant, I think that's unusual. And that's why I use the word singular. Uh, you use this in English in this sense. Uh, I went to dinner last night at that fancy restaurant and it was a singular experience. You, you say it's a unique experience. It could mean good or bad when you say it's a unique experience, right? Or he is singularly the best pitcher in baseball right now. You, uh, that's a little bit too contrived, but unique, singular in the sense of unique. Okay, armed with this fact, now we can proceed to tell you the logic behind our solutions from yesterday. So I'm gonna slide this off the top of paper and I'm gonna open up page two. And tear it off so that I can shift at the same time. So let's try to imitate the MVP of ODEs. It's so important, I will write it again. By the way, this MVP of ODE is also uh, applies to simply linear expressions. If there's a linear expression in Y right here, I equally well can write down the answer immediately. 
And that's something I notice when you're doing your work on your test in a simple linear problem. I don't mind if you use that same concept. So sometimes I wrote on your test, make sure, you know, notice that this is a linear problem. You could have written it like this with the MVP of ODs. So now I'm going to have this expression over here, this compact matrix based expression. How can I imitate this? This says differentiation is multiplication. Over here, I have differentiation. Is multiplication. But the difference is, this is, I emphasized this last time, scalar multiplication. This is matrix multiplication which by its very nature is slightly different than scalar multiplication. So then I ask myself a question, if I'm trying to imitate this, can I convert from using matrix multiplication to scalar multiplication? So, can I convert this matrix multiplication? to scalar multiplication? Writing and speaking at the same time is not very efficient. Working on a whiteboard is a little more efficient, but I'm gonna to stick to the paper here because the things I'm telling you today are this important. Do you wanna see them written down? Well, here's how we'll do it. Can I think of what it would take? What would it take for a matrix multiplication? Now I'm gonna speak very generically now. Any two by two matrix times any vector, two dimensional vector. What would it take for a matrix multiplication to become a scalar multiplication? And for the moment, I'll even use the same symbol, K. K is a real number. But in a moment later, we're going to replace that K with the traditional letter, lambda. Let's make a note of it. So soon we're going to write lambda instead of K. Because lambda is the classical letter we use in this situation. Well, let's think about it. Let's think about it by expanding the notation. A, B, C, D. Yep, move that paper up. That's my A. I'll just pick four numbers out of the air, but I won't tell you what they are. And let's say the V here is X, Y, just generic letters. The K times X, Y then becomes like this. Let's multiply these things out. AX plus BY, that's matrix multiplication CX plus DY equals, and I notice I might have taken this matrix equation now and split it into two literal equations, K times X and K times Y. That's what it means to multiply a scalar by a number, right? You multiply the scalar times both of these. You're scaling the vector. If that's a three, you're making a vector three times as long as the other one that you started with. Now let's gather these things together, a very organized way, make a generous use of space. AX minus KX plus BY equals zero. And CX plus BY minus KY equals zero. 
But that's the same thing as saying a minus kx. plus b y equals c x, or I'm sorry, not equals, equals zero and c x plus, I'm switching colors here for a reason, d minus k y equals zero. I switched colors there for a reason because I wanted you to focus on the X and the Y being repeated in those two lines, like the X and the Y were repeated in these two lines, which means what? That these two lines represent a matrix multiplication, like these two lines represented a matrix multiplication. So now I will pull apart the matrix and keep the color coding. A minus K, C, D minus K, and x, y. Since I've re-entered matrix equation land, I'll rewrite the zero, zero as the zero vector, the vector that's all got zeros in it. So remember what our original question is here. What would it take for matrix multiplication to be the same as scalar multiplication? Is it impossible? Is it ever possible? If it is possible, what conditions would we place on it? But now I'm into a new expression. I want you to look at the expression I have right here when I subtracted kx and ky from the other side. In matrix language, it was like saying a times xy minus k times xy. And your first reaction is, oh, you could factor out the common factor of xy. But a is a matrix and k is a number. How do you take a matrix minus a number? Which slot do you subtract the number in? Well, let me rewrite this slightly. a times xy minus k times the identity matrix times x, y. Because the beauty of this matrix, this is called the two by two identity, is one zero zero one times x, y is x, y. That these two lines remain the same. But now if I factor out the x, y, what I have is a minus k times identity. We use the capital letter i for identity matrix two by two, three by three, any size. If you need to specify the size, just put a little number here in the bottom. So what I have right here written down is A minus KI times vector V, remember XY was called V, equals zero vector. And now I get to reuse this fact that if I ever multiply a matrix times a vector and get zero vector, then either the vector is zero vector or the matrix has determinant zero. Now, do we want the V vector to be zero? What about that? Well, it would make this sentence true, but it's not very useful. Why is that not useful? Because up here we're asking, what would it take for A times V to be K times V? And if V is zero, zero, well, no one's gonna give me a prize for that. A times zero, zero is zero, zero. K times zero, zero is zero, zero. I'm not gonna get any reward for letting the V be zero. So let's assume then that the V is not the zero vector. I want to find out what's happening right here. That means the determinant of A minus KI has to be zero. 
I use the absolute value bars for a determinant. Sorry, slide up the paper. Let's take this to the next sheet of paper. This is sheet number three. So let's look at A minus KI determinant equals zero. And remember A minus KI is right up here. A minus K, D minus K. So subtract K on the main diagonal. That's a quick way to say it. Subtract K on the main diagonal and leave all the other entries alone, A, B, C, D. So that means that determinant of A minus K, D minus K, B, C, zero. But how do you take the determinant of a two by two matrix, multiply the main diagonal, subtract the off diagonal product. So this is A minus K, D minus K minus B, C equals zero. But now we get the big payoff. Let's multiply this out. AD minus AK minus KD. KD, DK, doesn't matter. D and K are both real numbers. Minus plus K squared minus BC equals zero. It looks like a random string of multiplications, but if you look at it really closely, and organize it properly. Begin with a k squared. And then look at these two pieces that have a k in them. Let's factor out the k. And let's say a plus d. I'll factor out the minus sign too. And then what are the two things left over? ad minus bc. AD minus BC, that's a positive expression. And now your jaw drops because what we just wrote down was K squared minus trace plus determinant equals zero. And now we come full circle to where we stopped last time when I was showing you how to make those solutions. So what's the question? What would it take to make matrix multiplication into scalar multiplication so I can imitate this answer? And after all this work, I finally come down to my answer. It would take K to be a root a root, a solution, to this problem, to this quadratic equation. I have a son who's a great Star Trek fan. I'm a great Star Trek fan. Of course, I also like Star Wars. So whenever I want to annoy him, I tell him that Star Wars is much better than Star Trek. But then maybe if you're Star Wars buff, if you've seen a couple of movies, then you've heard this quote before. Well, this is a quadratic equation. And, you know, like Obi-Wan Kenobi said, you know, Sith Lords are our speciality. Well, quadratic equations are our speciality. In other words, there's never been a quadratic equation that we can't solve. Even in the worst case scenario, I've got a formula for it, right? So can I find the numbers to make this possible? The answer is yes. And it turns out to be a very simple task. All I have to do is solve a quadratic equation. And the quadratic equation is using the trace of this matrix and the determinant of this matrix. And remember, two by two matrices, trace and determinant are the easiest things we could calculate. Trace is A plus D, and the determinant is AD minus BC. So we're about to do an example, but I want to point out one special thing to you. So we can easily find 
the answers to this quadratic equation. Right too fast and I get sloppy. Let's give them a name. Lambda one, lambda two. This is where the tradition comes in. These are called the eigenvalues of A. Now, I know there might be a question in the back of your mind. You say like, yeah, but every quadratic equation doesn't have answers. It doesn't have roots. Some quadratic equations have no roots. You mean no real roots. Every quadratic equation has two answers, right? If I say to you, k squared minus 4k minus 5 equals 0, then the answers are lambda 1 equals 5 and lambda 2 equals minus 1. You could check those out and see that they work. If I say to you k squared minus 4k minus 4 equals 0, then the answers are lambda 1, I'm sorry, plus 4 equals 0, then the answers are lambda 1 equals 2, and lambda 2 equals 2. If I say to you k squared, sorry, move the paper up, minus 4k plus 13 equals zero. Then the answers are lambda one, and this is a little bit nastier, two plus three i, and lambda two equals two minus three i. This is where the nastiness comes into our equation. Every quadratic equation under the sun has two answers. Sometimes we have to qualify that by saying there are two answers and it's one number repeated twice. But I still call these two answers. It's called a double root. Sometimes the answer is there are two answers, but they're not real. They're imaginary. But again, it's still two answers. So when I say let's call them lambda 1 and lambda 2, the eigenvalues of A, every matrix has two, every two by two matrix has two eigenvalues, then I am allowing them to possibly be the same, that could happen, and I'm allowing them to possibly be complex. And those are special cases that we have to talk about in a second. But let's compare k squared minus tk plus d with the product of k minus lambda one and k minus lambda two. Because if these are the roots of that quadratic equation, then this quadratic equation factors. Now factoring includes repeats and factoring includes complex numbers, which looks really ugly. But let's just say it does legally factor. Now multiply this expression out. What do you get? K squared minus lambda 1k minus lambda 2k plus lambda one times lambda two on the very end, the two negatives make a positive. But now do that same factor out the k trick with a minus sign. You get lambda one plus lambda two. K squared minus lambda one plus lambda two k plus lambda one times lambda two. And now you just got a massive new gift. This polynomial was made of the trace and determinant of the matrix. And trace is AD, A plus D. And determinant is AD minus BC. But if I can identify the eigenvalues, what I just learned is that lambda one plus lambda two must be the same as the trace. And lambda one times lambda two must be the same as the determinant.
Okay, we're almost done with our theoretical discussion. And then we can start cranking out answers just like a machine. So let's suppose I've been given a matrix and I found these magic eigenvalues. I found the magic Ks. The K is lambda one and lambda two. And for that reason, people usually write this as AV equals lambda V. They just use a generic letter lambda to stand for the variable, the real number that you're solving for. But I could do it either way right now. So I want to know what is that magic vector V that's non-zero that I can multiply by this expression. So I want to solve this. So again, I'm gonna write this down until we get sick of seeing me write these things down. So now that I found the magic Ks, can I solve? the system A minus K, D minus K, BC times XY equals zero, zero. Can I solve this system for X and Y? Yeah, zero, zero would be a solution, but that was a silly solution. I want to find a non-zero X and Y that solve this problem. Those are called the eigenvectors. So let's take our first example and then I'll show you graphics after the break. Let's say I have my differential equation, Y prime equals A Y. And let's say the A in this problem is uh, zero, one, six and minus five. What's the first thing we do? Write down the trace and write down the determinant. Make sure you get those numbers straight, right? So now let's try to solve this characteristic equation. It's called the characteristic equation. I don't mind whether you use K or Lambda now, pretty soon I'll start to use Lambdas there. K minus trace, that's plus 5K, plus determinant, and that's minus 6. So pretty soon, maybe even right now, we'll just start writing lambda in place of the K, the traditional letter lambda. Can you solve this? Well, quadratic formula if necessary, but this is something that can be factored into lambda minus one, lambda plus six. You can factor that and see that it equals this. So that means I'm saying lambda one is one. What makes this sentence zero? Lambda minus one is zero. Lambda one is one. And my lambda two, my magic lambda, minus six. So now let's solve a minus lambda i times v equals zero. For lambda one equals one. That means I'm gonna take this matrix and subtract one on the main diagonal. Be very careful that you subtract one on the main diagonal. Six and minus six. And remember, we talked about this very briefly when we did the illustration yesterday. How do I find a vector that's perpendicular to these two? I literally just switch the two numbers and change one sign. I could have said minus six and six and change the minus six to six. But one, one is the magic vector associated with the magic value. I should stop saying magic. One, one is the eigenvector 
associated with this eigenvalue. Notice that eigenvectors are not unique. I could have used six, six, I could have used two, two, I could have used pi, pi, I could have used one seventh, one seventh, or root two, root two. Let's do the other one, and then we're closing in on our break. And I'll give you a big safety catch here too. Now let's subtract negative six on the main diagonal. Make sure you subtract negative six, which means adding six on the main diagonal. So when you add six on the main diagonal, sorry, move up my paper. When you add six on main diagonal, what do you get when you subtract negative six? What do you get? Six, one, six, negative five, subtract negative six. Say it to yourself, not negative 11, positive one. And with these ratios, can I name a vector that will get killed by both of them? Sure, one minus six. That's my second eigenvector. Now I have two solutions to my system. Solutions are eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t. You might say, oh, that's a coincidence. Minus six, minus six, one, one. There's a reason for that, but it doesn't always happen. So don't bank on it. But now we are at the place we were at yesterday. I just gave you two answers to this differential equation. In fact, they're two independent answers, but this is a good place for us to take a break. So now what I've shown you is the reason why I can think of a first order linear system as a complete analogy to the MVP of ODEs. I can treat this the way I treated this, just be number times exponential, except now it's gonna be vector times exponential, vector times exponential. So let's relax for a second. Let's come back at uh, 105. And then I'll show you some beautiful graphics associated with this and show you how these two answers by themselves are good enough to make any answer to this problem no matter where you start, no matter what the initial condition is. Okay, I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs for a second and you can do the same and we'll come right back.
Okay, we're back. And we're about to show you some beautiful graphics. Now this example that we just did right here was just a sample matrix. I made that matrix so that it would give me this nice clean answer. You're well within your rights to say, what if the answer is not nice and clean? What if the lambdas are complex numbers? What if the lambdas are repeated? What if the lambdas are simply some ugly square root garbage? Because I remember getting that all the time when I did the quadratic equation. Well, we have to deal with that. But first, I just wanted a mellow example. And those questions that I just asked, they're the whole subject of chapter three. The what ifs, the cases. But first, let me show you something beautiful about these two solutions. If I was to draw these in the x, y plane, so use x and y as my variables, Let's take a look at these two expressions. Now, one, one is a vector. One, one is a vector, or I could identify it as a point. Let's call it the point right here, one, one. And the e the t, you know what e the t does. It gets bigger and bigger the farther out you go for t. Well, positive t's, this grows humongously, right? But what do I care if I got a humongous number times one, one? It's just humongous, humongous. You know, if this is 400, then this is 400, 400, which is on the same line, but way, way out here. On the other hand, if T becomes small, T is a negative number. This is one over E to that number's positive vision. As E becomes, as T becomes smaller and smaller negative number, this gets closer and closer to zero, like one, one million. But what's one one millionth times one one? Just one one millionth, one one millionth. Same line, but very close to the origin. So what we have here, these things are called straight line solutions. Because they travel on straight lines. Now this straight line solution, Y1, actually travels out. So I indicate that with the arrow like this. But I got some interesting news for you. Remember when we picked one, one to be our eigenvector? Why didn't I pick six, six? Why didn't I pick minus one, minus one? I could have, and it would have given me another straight line solution, but it would just be along this 45 degree line. Remember this is, an eigenvector. This is an eigenvector. Eigenvectors are not unique. For any given eigenvalue, there are many eigenvectors I can assign to it, that they all live on the same line. So let's say, let's pretend that was minus one, minus one. That would be an equally valid solution. Also going out. Now let's look at one and minus six. I'm gonna to need to create some more space here. One and minus six, I, maybe I didn't choose that minus six so wisely, is way down here. I'm saying one box is one unit right now. This is blue, maybe blue doesn't come across on the camera, but it's gonna come across on the scanning later. And this is also a straight line solution. So much so that I run off the paper. But this time, what's the t? The minus 6t. This is exponential decay. As time goes forwards, I decay. I get smaller and smaller numbers, but still glued to this vector. So this stream 
this straight line solution is going inwards. Here's its opposite mirror image, minus one six coming in here, going inwards. Now there's one more thing I'm gonna to add to this picture. And that is, are there any equilibrium solutions to this problem? Are there any constants where the derivative is zero, zero and the product is zero, zero? Well, certainly zero, zero, the origin itself is an equilibrium solution. So I could add that to this image as a black dot at the origin. The one equilibrium point, equilibrium solution to this problem. Now let's look at this as it was an ocean. And I've got a current shooting out on this 45 degree line. And it's shooting out at a certain rate. But then on this blue line, I have a current that's very, very fast going to the origin. And remember our bathtub analogy? What happens if I release a boat in this ocean right there? Well, there's pressure from the blue curve pushing the boat down into the red curve. But then there's pressure as long as you get closer to the red curve pushing the boat out. So I see this boat starting at two zero. Let's look at the initial condition. two zero, or if you like to say it that way, why not is two zero. And let's envision where this boat floats. This boat is gonna shoot out in the future. It's gonna come close to this red line and shoot out kind of asymptotically. That's the future of this boat. What's the past of this boat? It must have been as if it sailed in similar to the blue curve, not parallel, but asymptotically. Now, I didn't make these equal to, and I'll show you why I didn't make them equal in a second, but this has got to be the future of this boat along Y1. This has got to be the past of this boat along Y2. Let's try it for a point right here. Again, pushing the boat down, pushing the boat out, the boat is gonna be coming out like this, tight, to that line. In the future, it's gonna go out the Y1 stream. In the past, it must've come in the Y2 stream. And mirror image on the other sides. If I released a boat right there, I believe it would flow this way. If I released a boat right here, I believe it would flow this way. Now what I've just drawn you is a phase portrait. It is a complete and exhaustive demonstration of everything that can happen to this system. y prime equals 0, 1, 6 minus 5 y. These are all the possible types of solutions to this system. If I release a boat in a different place over here, well, then of course it's going to follow a different path. But it's going to look like that path that I already drew, right? So I'm going to have things that copy or seem to be copying. if I add lots and lots of paths. Not becoming the red line, but becoming asymptotic to the red line. Everything is determined by the blue pressure and the red pressure, by the Y1 pressure and the Y2 pressure. Now let's do this on computer. Okay, so I'm gonna share screen with you in just a second and get a mathematic notebook going. 
It's the first order linear systems Mathematica notebook. It's the one we linked to on our website that I pointed out to you last time. And I'm just making sure I got a clean copy of this. Okay, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Looks good. Okay, so let's share this Mathematica notebook with you. And the next thing I want to do is make sure you see what I see. Yes, got it. And now let's execute this problem in the Mathematica notebook. But remember, Mathematica has got a lot of juice. Mathematica is a computer algebra system. So all these things that I calculated with my bare hands, trace, determinant, eigenvalue, eigenvector, that's just the press of a button to Mathematica. If I input the system correctly, of course, any calculator would give you all these two. So here's how I enter a matrix in Mathematica. I call it a list of lists. So 0, 1, 6, minus 5. Here's the first list is the top row. Second list is the second row. Then I can show you that matrix by using the command matrix form. Otherwise, Mathematica doesn't care. It's just a list of lists. If you ask it to show you the matrix, it'll show you the list of lists. Mathematica has a built-in command called trace and determinant, but it writes it TR and DET. Notice the capitalizations and the square brackets. This special polynomial we created is called the characteristic polynomial of the matrix. And Mathematica knows how to calculate that. Lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant. Then lastly, Mathematica knows how to do eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I hit the button and I just get it all at once, right? There's our matrix. Trace was minus five, determinant was minus six. Characteristic equation. Mathematica wrote the lambda squared at the end instead of the beginning. That's not different. The eigenvalues are minus six and one. We wrote one and minus six. Again, that's not different, that's just order. But Mathematica writes things in the order that pleases itself, not pleases us. So we have to adjust. We have to recognize that this is the same as one and minus six. Here are the two eigenvectors, one, one, which we did, and Mathematica chose minus one, six. I don't have any problem with that. It was a valid choice, but Mathematica started with the one on the other side. I still get the same two straight line solutions. Now, let's draw the graphics for this that I try to draw the paper. So I'm gonna pick some window, time window, minus five to five, X window, Y window, minus five to five. And let's give some initial condition like the one I drew on the paper, two, zero. Let's say X naught is two, Y naught is zero. I'm just defining these variables so I can feed them to Mathematica. So here I'm gonna input the system. I literally show Mathematica the matrix multiplication by saying the A, B, C, and D, which is the one, one entry to matrix A, the one, two entry, et cetera. You can look at the syntax. X of zero is X naught, Y of zero is Y naught. So what I'm doing is telling Mathematica, I'm describing a problem to you. I'm calling it my system. Mathematica repeats back to me what I told it. So did I, you know, did it, did it understand what I said? The answer is yes. Now let's do some streamlines and field for this. Uh, when I wrote this book, I called it my streamlines and my field, but that's not very different. Uh, I've cleaned this up with the stream color function and the stream points. You can adjust your notebook, vector color function, none, vector style, blue. Let's see what this produces. Let's show the field and the streamlines, show my streamlines and my field. And that's what I expected it to look like. That matches 
what I drew on my hand drawing. Now let me show them to you side by side so you can see them both at once. There's the field and the streamlines. Now in my face portrait, I had a lot more streamlines, right? Because I added streamlines along straight line solutions. I could go back and do that. So let's say for stream points, let's comment out the initial condition first. And let's throw down a lot of initial points that match those straight line solutions. How about like one, one? I'll go over here and show you how it shows up. See, that's the thing going out. Now let's make that blue to distinguish it from the other ones. Let's throw down, copy, minus one, minus one. While we're here, let's copy that and throw down one minus six and minus one six, all blue. Oops, somehow I lost the one one and one minus one minus one or the one minus six. Oh, the minus six is outside my window. I have to scale that. Let's call it 0 0.5 and minus three because that could give Mathematica a headache. I was referring to a point that wasn't in the window. I'm sorry that I'm hopping up and down. I hope you don't get seasick. There's the two straight line solutions. Now let's pick a solution in each quadrant. Maybe I should turn on that two zero. See how it works. Okay, there's the two zero. Let's do a symmetric one on the other side. So what I'm gonna do is take these, copy, paste, and put in here the physical two zero, although I already have it in the X not Y not, and then put in the minus two zero. Those are the solutions that veer off on this curve. Now I made those both blue, but that's veering off to the upper right and veering off to the lower left, although Mathematica doesn't go all the way with the drawing. Let's pick a point like one, three and minus one, minus three. What I have here, oops, I said minus one, minus three, excuse me. I'm looking for symmetry here. I'm trying to place these points symmetrically. There we go. That is the phase portrait of that expression. It fits this field. I could show you how it fits the field. Let's make the field arrows red. And let's put these both into one thing by using the show command. Just grab these two, but I won't erase what I've done. I'll just repeat what I've done. There's the flow of that system along the arrows. Okay, so where else do I wanna go with this? But see, yeah, it's hugging the Y1 very tightly, but it's kind of not going backwards onto the Y2 as much. That's because the Y2 pressure is so much sharper. You could say that Y2 pressure is placing it down on Y1 much faster. You could also say Y1 is sucking up solutions. In some case, you could say Y1 is a dominant eigenvector in that sense. Now, let me add one more thing to this. I've got all these cool stream points, right? But let's also run some automatic stream points.
and show you what this looks like. And your first reaction is, man, you screwed that up because the blue ones and the kind of light blue ones are competing. They're not easy to see. So let's do it this way. Let's make the automatic ones stream style. Light gray. It's got a more dramatic effect. There, now I see lots and lots of streamlines, but I'm muting the ones that I don't need, the repeats, the too much information ones. I'm just giving you the key solutions. Two straight line solutions in each direction, or you could say, you know, straight line solutions along those two directions. And then in each quadrant, the two straight line solutions cut the plane into four quadrants. And in each quadrant, I give you a sample of how things flow. When I said to you the other day that we're gonna be more exact with our phase portraits, this is what I mean. I don't even like this phase portrait the computer drew. It's a little bit too sparse. If you asked me for a face portrait for this problem, I'll go back to my paper, I would have drawn that without the extra superfluous ones. I would have drawn the face portrait to be straight line solution, straight line solution. This is too rough, but I would have drawn something like that. That immediately reminds you of something, doesn't it? your calculus three days, uh, the contours of a saddle surface. For that reason, this equilibrium point in this phase portrait is called a saddle. And now we're gonna go crazy naming equilibrium points. Okay, two more things I want to show you before I do another demonstration. But <coughs> one thing is I wanted to show you that Mathematica would do the phase portrait if you coaxed it to, as we did here. So back to this. It can also, I got more on this sheet. I actually tell Mathematica to solve the system and Mathematic actually gives me the individual solutions to the system. What's this two seventh and 12 sevenths? I'll tell you what that is in a second. And then I can plot the X and T and Y of T graphs separately from the phase plane. Excuse me. So there's that solution as it's drawn in the phase plane, but here are the separate X of T and Y of T graphs. Remember, this black curve has two components, an X component, a Y component. Separately, the X and Y components look like this. I don't got a very intelligent time scale here. I can make this more interesting to look at by cutting off some of this empty time. But do you see the initial value? Two for X, initial value zero for Y. Uh, notice I named these X as Ys and Vs because Oh, well, I just named the axis label Y's and V's. We can fix that. You can name the axis label anything you like. You can name the axis label dog and cat if you want to. So there's cat, there's dog, there's X, there's Y, there's Y, there's T, there's V. So don't be too impressed by labeling things like that, but that's how you label axes with the axes label command. I shouldn't be so silly as to say dog and cat. This was T and X. And this one was T and Y. Okay, so now I got the X of T graph and the Y of T graph. Okay, good. So again, uh, you could TI-89, TI-INSPIRE, you could produce all these graphs exactly the same way. What's the difference between 89 Inspire and Mathematica? 
Mathematica, you change a value, you just hit shift return uh, in your calculator, inspire, stuff like that. You do have to press like 50 buttons to get any information entered. That's why you kind of like Mathematica better than you like your calculators generally. It creates much more flexible and pretty pictures, right? Okay, so back out. So now let's do some other calculations for fun. And we are solidly in section 3.3 right now, where they first show you a saddle. 3.2 and 3.3 are cases where you have the simplest straight line solution. I want to go back up to here and show you some valuable things. Picking the eigenvector is really never difficult. Remember, I just said you switch these two numbers and change one of the signs. So I could have said minus one, minus one. I just don't like minus signs. But let me give you another tip. Do you see how these two rows in the adjusted matrix? I said that last time. This is some people call this the adjusted matrix because you've subtracted the lambda on the main diagonal. Do you see how these two rows are the same? That doesn't have to be the case. These two rows are not the same, right? But what do you say about these two rows? Oh, they're multiples of each other. That's the only way you could find a non-zero point getting sent to the origin. These two rows in each case have to be multiples of each other. Let me write that down. Rows are multiples of each other. And that fact is so strong that this amounts to a safety check. If you ever subtract your lambdas and the rows aren't multiples of each other, you screwed up. This is a safety check. So not only is it easy to pick eigenvectors, you have a safety check right in front of you. It doesn't protect you from other errors, but at least it protects you from badly subtracting your lambdas. Okay, let's try another problem. Uh, now, now we're at the stage where the fastest way to learn is to do. And, and I want to acknowledge all the questions you have in your mind still. You're saying, what if I repeat roots? What if I have two and two? What if I have complex roots? What am I going to do? We're going to handle that tomorrow. I want to say one more thing about these two eigenvectors, 1, 1, and 1 minus 6. Basically, these are the two initial values of the problem. Y1 and 0 is 1, 1. That's where that boat started. Y2 at 0 is 1 minus 6. So you hear these words, and you see them on the homework problem you're handing in tonight. It's linearly independent. What does that mean? Linearly independent means these vectors are not multiples of each other. They go in independent directions. They're not on top of each other. Good. So all you need to do, if someone asks you, are they linearly independent? The solutions, are these solutions linearly independent? Just check the initial values, which are right there. If the initial values don't lie on the same line, if they're not copies of each other, then they are independent. So this is more linear algebra I'm teaching you. However, in that case, that test for linear independence that I just gave you, specifically for two by twos, if someone gave you a three by three, uh, three dimensional vectors and said, are they linearly independent? You have to be more careful, but we're not doing that case. Okay, next example. Let's crank out another example. So I can get you some more terminology. Let's say y prime equals a y. Let me give you a new matrix. Let's practice it again. Let's say the matrix is, and I just want to think here for a second. Let me pick something not too shocking. So I gotta do this off on my scratch paper side here. I'm gonna pick mellow, mellow numbers right now, just so that I don't cause any disasters. Let's try 4 minus 1. 
and uh, 2 minus 3. Let me see if that is what I want it to be. Looks good. I like it. Now, be careful about how you approach people's problems when they write them down. Your first reaction is, oh, he just wrote down some random numbers. Uh, not really. One, two, three, four. Uh, okay, he wrote down some numbers in a random pattern. No, I picked these numbers so that would make a nice example. And I'll show you how to do that later, but that's not what we're doing today. But let's solve this first order differential system. 4, 2, minus 3, minus 1, x, y. Or if you like to write it in the full out form, x prime is 4x plus 2y. And y prime is minus 3x minus 1y. Remember, these are the same problem. Same writing, either way. Let's give it an initial condition. It says uh, y at zero is uh, two, one. Now in this expression, that'd be saying x of zero, y of zero is two, one. You gotta get used to the way people write. And in this, it would be saying x of zero is two and y of zero is one. Also get used to the people that write two comma one like that. You gotta live with all sorts of people, right? Okay, what do we do? Number one, we take the matrix, four, sorry, a little bit sloppy there, four, two, minus three, minus one. And the very first thing we do is write down its trace and determine it. Trace, 4 plus negative 1 is 3. Determinant, negative 4, subtract negative 6. Negative 4, subtract negative 6 is 2. Good. Now make sure you get those two right, because if you get one of those two wrong, there's no power on Earth it's gonna get you to the correct answer. So this is like very unforgiving. It's a mechanical procedure, but it's very unforgiving. There's safety checks along the way, but just be absolutely sure you don't screw up the first number you write down. Trace three, negative four minus negative six is positive two. Next thing I write down is the characteristic equation. Lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant equals zero. In this case, that's lambda squared minus three lambdas plus two, respect that minus sign. Again, you forget this minus sign, you're DED dead. You have nothing left to do. You'd be very exact about this. But the safety checks are coming. Okay, so what are my solutions. I picked something again that factors. How does this factor? Minus two, minus one. So I have two eigenvalues, two, and eigenvalue number two is one. I didn't pretend it, I didn't pick it that way. I, I just call this lambda one, first eigenvalue two, second eigenvalue one. I could have wrote them in the other order. Now let's do the adjusted matrix and get the eigenvectors. And so for lambda one equals two, I keep numbering my pages, excuse me, make a time out there. So the adjusted matrix, remember it's subtract two on the main diagonal. So that gives me a two, two, and it gives me a minus three, minus three. Now I feel good about that. That does not mean I haven't done an error. Maybe I could have done errors up here, but if I would have done errors up here, maybe this safety check would have failed. So you could think about that. How 
am I going to get 0, 0? If we were in class, I would make you repeat this until you were sick of it. I would make you speak it out loud like a class learning a foreign language. But I can't conveniently make you speak it out loud because of time lags here. But how do I find a vector that I multiply by this matrix to get 0, 0? That vector I choose is 1 minus 1. I change these two numbers, I switch them, which is still 2, 2, and then I take and change one of the signs, say 2 minus 2 or minus 2, 2. But then on top of that, to make my life easier, I pick the lowest, I take out any common factor. So 1 and minus 1 is clearly a vector that goes to 0, 0. What we say right here in language is a minus 2i kills 1 minus 1. Now, this is math slang, but I don't mind if you use this. It's not, a, it's not a wicked thing to say. When I say that this matrix kills that vector, I mean it destroys it. It sends it to 0, 0. It, another word people use is annihilates. Math is a very martial thing you know, from, from the days of Napoleon, employing mathematicians to work out the trajectories of his cannonballs. Mathematics has always had a dark and martial side, but we try not to follow that path every day. Anyway, this matrix annihilates that vector. Okay, other one, lambda two equals one. Let's subtract one on the main diagonal. So that gives me three, two. And minus three, subtract one. In the next slot, minus two. Okay, again, rows are multiple of each other. I feel good. Now I make you pick an eigenvector. And this time, Rows are multiples, but I don't get to use a happy number like one. I have to like say two and minus three. I switch the numbers, change one sign. I can't make it better than that. That's reduced as far as I can. Now I have my two eigenvectors. I could have chosen otherwise. I could have chosen minus two, three. But these are good enough. They give me my two solutions. Y1 of t. Sorry. Move paper up is one minus one e to the two t eigen vector e to the eigen value t and the y two of t is two minus three e to the 1t. I'll just write e to the t. Now, what are we going to do? We wanted a solution that goes through 2, 1, right? Let's make a quick sketch of these two solutions. Although it's not going to be as pleasant to sketch this one. What I've got here is one minus one is down here. And this is exponential growth, right? So I'm going out the door. And it's mirror image goes likewise out the door. What about two and minus three? Let's draw that one in blue. That is also exponential growth. Sorry, shook the camera. That's also exponential growth. So two and minus three is right here. So that goes out the door also at a slightly different angle. And the angle is so tight, it's not easy to draw. Remember the last problem when I said the two straight line solutions cut the plane into four quadrants? So it is here. There are four different pieces of the plane, but the ones in between here are so tight Now let's look at the boat at two and one. 
There's a boat at two and one. Every box is worth one step. What's going to happen to that boat? Is it going to shoot straight out too? Well, let's think about the two curves, the blue curve and the red curve. Here's y1. And the blue one was y2. Which one is stronger? The e to the 2t grows faster than e to the t. You could say this solution is stronger. Or sometimes people could use the word dominant. That means this boat that's launched right here is going to eventually follow the blue curve or be influenced by the blue curve. And the red curve is weaker. So it doesn't go straight out because the blue curve dominates. It kind of curls out like that. Now here's the problem. That is totally eyeballing it. I will not know whether this is correct or not until I do my computer graphics. The quality is correct. It's curling out towards the blue. And if I was on this side, it would curl out towards the blue that way. And if I was between red and blue, it would curl towards the blue also, parallel to asymptotic to not being absorbed by. But there the situation is so slight, it's hard to see. Out, out, out. So it's, this is a phase portrait I just drew right here. But these two thin slivers of quadrants are very hard to document nicely. But where's my proof? I'm just blowing smoke until I produce a graph with that green curve, right? How do I make it? I want to go through the point to one. And now here's where the independence comes in. The blue street is in the direction two minus three. The red street is in the direction one minus one. Those two streets are independent. They could, in, if you like, they could form a grid on this, but not a rectangular grid. It would be a diagonal parallelogram grid. So if I want to know the solution green here, I need to know how much red curve I should use and how much blue curve I could use. And the way I know is by solving this equation, two equations, two unknowns. Two equals k1 plus 2k2, or one equals minus k1. One, excuse me, equals minus k1. I slipped to the bottom of the paper, minus 3k2. Now, that will tell me how much of the first answer to use and how much of the second answer to use or a better better description than how much is what ratio of these two curves should i use so now this is back to algebra days you do what you used to do you have to tell me what k1 and k2 are i'm not going to interfere you have to get it right if you don't get it right you don't get any reward. But if you take this system of equations any way you look at it and solve it, then you get k2 is minus 1 and k1 uh, is 3. Now, again, this is meaningless unless I check. 3 times 1 minus 2. No, I guess I'm going to have to pump that up to 4. 4 times 1 minus 2 is 2, and 4 times minus 1 is negative 4. Minus 1 times 3 is 3, positive. Minus 4, my goodness, I'm really screwing this up, aren't I? Let's try it again. See, there's no penalty for screwing things up, right? As long as you correct it. Let me think about this again. Literally, I'm adding these equations. I get a minus 1, I get a 3 there. I should have said minus three, K2 is minus three. K2 is minus three, it's six, I need an eight. 
I need an eight right there. Let's try it again. Eight times one minus three times two is two. Negative eight plus nine is one. This is it. There's no penalty for bouncing around and screwing up unless we were timing things, but make sure you get the final answer in the end. So now my solution is eight of these and minus three of these. I could literally write the equations. And since Mathematica is about to do it for me, I'll do that for you. I could literally take this top row and the bottom row separately. Eight e to the two t minus six e to the t. This one is minus eight e to the two t. And this one is plus nine e to the t. By the way, this phase portrait is not a saddle. It is not a saddle. I have solutions being shot out in all directions. Everything is leaving the origin. There's my equilibrium point. This is what we used to call source. If they were all going in, I would call it a sink. Do you remember how we used to do our equilibrium points? Sink source node. Well, today we're in section 3.3, three, it's sink source saddle. Sink, both in, source, both out. One in, one out. Like this picture, it's called a saddle. Unfortunately, we got many, many more names to go. Well, not unfortunately. Okay, let's crank this into Mathematica. Let's see if I get this exact answer. Let's see if that green curve I drew roughly to scale. So I'm going to share screen with you. I'm going back to the top of that sheet to put in this new matrix. What was the new matrix? Four, two, minus three, minus one. Again, Mathematica kind of shocks me with how quickly it does all these calculations. Well, it doesn't shock me. I just feel inadequate, right? But I don't want you to feel inadequate. It's the machine telling you you are right. Now, the problem is if you only rely on the machine and you can't do this by yourself, you're pretty badly messed up. And I'm talking about those what, a couple hundred criminals they rounded up yesterday? Hey, you want a free cell phone? I know it's not the same thing, but let's talk about that. If all you can do is press the buttons on the computer, you're gonna be replaced. You're gonna be replaced pretty quickly, actually. And you're gonna be dealing with devices that you have no idea how they work which of course I am right now with my phone and my computer. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very good at knowing exactly what they do. Maybe I'm being hacked right now. I'm just saying, don't rely on a machine to give you your answers. You rely on a machine to confirm your answers. Okay, let's put in the initial condition. The initial condition was what, two and one? Let's feed it the problem again. Let's plot things. I think all these points that I just do are probably way, way, way overkill. So that's not gonna help me right now. It's gonna make a pretty ugly picture, but let's take a look at it anyway. Whoa. It's going a different direction than I expected. I thought it was flying out the other way. Well, this is why we do the calculations, right? Either I'm wrong or the computer's wrong. Let's find out which one. Because I got it kind of twisting the other way, right? There's no harm in being wrong as long as you can correct it. So back first, I'm gonna make sure I enter the matrix correctly. Four, two, minus three, minus one. That looks good. I can do another safety check by multiplying by two, one. Give me uh, eight plus two, 10, and minus six, minus one. 
minus seven. So 10 and minus seven. Things are not looking good for me. I have a little more faith in the computer's drawing right now. So let me go back to my paper and decide, well, let's not go back to my paper. Let's follow the computer solution and see, because it had the right eigenvalues. I had the right eigenvalues. I had the right eigenvectors up to a multiple, that's fine. But somehow I combined them in my drawing badly. So let's go here, let's put in our problem, but let's get rid of all these extra blue things. Let's just look at the initial value through x dot y naught through the two one. Let's keep the light gray stuff. Yeah, it's saying that solution curled that way. And there are other safety checks I can perform that we'll talk to you about later, but I'm going to have to surrender to the machine. But I'm going to have to go back and find out why, too. Now I think I see why. But what I want to do before I do that is show you that Mathematica actually solves the system exactly. And it matches what we had here. Now it wrote it in a funny way, but it, what it says right here is 8e to the 2t minus 6e to the t. That's what we wrote for x. And y is 9e to the t minus 8e to the 2t. That is exactly what we have on our paper here. So our calculations were good. My rushed interpretation of this picture was bad. Let's look at these things separately right here. Yeah, it's peeling off that way. So let's go back to my paper because we're at the end of our hour now. And let's find out why I went the wrong way. So I'm going to look at this very carefully. Larger eigenvalue, stronger dominant. But do you see what I did? I wrote stronger and dominant in blue, and then I attached it to the blue solution. But the blue solution was here. So this is really silly of me. This thing peeled off this way, very tightly, by the way. So this was terrible. This thing was peeling off that way. The solution that was stronger and dominant was the red solution, Y1. So that's a really silly error to make. That's what you get when you're trying to draw with colors and talk and draw at the same time. Okay. I want to say one more thing before we go, but now you're equipped to do all the problems from 3, 1, 3, 2, and 3, 3. Do you remember what we used to call phase lines? Now we look back on them fondly because they were very simple. You either went both in and you called it a sink, or you went both out and you called it a source, and you went in one and out the other, you called that a node, or you went the other direction, you called that a node. Now, when we go both in, we call that a sink. When we go both out, we call that a source. And when we go one in, one out, We call that a saddle, not a node, but a saddle. The problem is this is one dimensional and this is two dimensional. And in one dimension, this is all I can ever do. Those are the only possibilities I have. But in two dimensions, these three straight line cases are just scratching the surface. I have four cases here. When I get done with this, and then I account, 13 to 15 cases, which we'll start to enumerate next time. Okay, thank you, you've been very patient, but you picked up a serious skill today Maybe you've done things like this before, 
but I wanted to express it to you in a particular way. Okay, so I'm going to turn off the recording. If you want to hang out for a second, ask a question, which is fine.